So I would say that. Cool. All right. Now it's Chris's turn. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. It's structurally sound. So, uh, can everyone hear me in the back? Yeah? Good. Yeah. If I'm getting too quiet, just raise your thumb. And I'll speak louder. <clears throat> Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Please have yourself some pizza and we have waters and stuff. Thanks, JB. Okay, so it should be. I don't know how long this talk is going to take. It's actually happening in practice. So um, if you're here and you're, and you're here like in a product management aspect and I get to the code stuff, like you can walk out of the market and be offended. But, so <clears throat> um, introducing all the. Like, so, so we'll talk, what is. Uh, why? That I build on complete. What is it? How did I do it? Lessons learned and a QA session. So, why autocomplete JS? So, let me. Autocomplete is a JavaScript widget that implements autocomplete. So, raise your hand if you're familiar with autocomplete. That's everybody, right? That's my thing. Autocomplete involves a program predicting a word or phrase that blah, 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 and the computer already knows where it is. The important part is it speeds up human computer interactions. When it's well suited. So, <coughs> I think that it's far from like user experience. Like, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for people to use autocomplete in their web applications and their websites, and they're not doing it. Right? If you have any kind of inclination of what the user is going to type, right? so think about lists. Right? I mean, raise your hand if you use lists and drop downs in your application. That's, right? That's a lot of people, right? Um, I think it's very fast for a user. And if they know what they're looking for, you can get really, really fast. You can find things really, really quickly. Like, uh, like who's ever had the experience of knowing where something is located on a web page and knowing how to navigate like maybe five pages in to get there, but it is faster to Google for the phrase which you know will bring up exactly that page. I'm getting head nods, right? Why? Because it's much faster to type directly to the thing that you need. Right? You can break down hierarchies of information extremely quickly with, with your fingers with typing. And I hope to demonstrate that when I show the uh, show the examples. Yes. Do you ever ever have any overhead problems with uh, uh, list uh, number of libraries you have? Number of number of lists. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure I understand the question. If you have one list, five lists, twenty five lists, um, yeah. trying to be complete, how how far can you go without taxing the system? That's a that's a wonderful wonderful problem that I have solved with all. Or I would, I would like to think that I've solved it, so hopefully I've solved that specific problem. Uh, okay, so that, you know, that's what I'll uh, My team, I was on a team here at Pros, I work at Pros, by the way, that's where we are. I was on a team that was using autocomplete, and uh, the customers really liked it, and it was, I would say, it was, core, it was core functionality for the application, letting people drill down and find things they needed. <clears throat> but we weren't completely happy with the widget that we were using, I'll show you that widget. Um, we had some issues with it, we'll discuss that. So. Other teams were using other autocomplete libraries, um, and they had had to hack some things to deepen the guts of these libraries. And it was working well for them, but that's not a great solution long term. And the real pressing issue is that other teams of pros wanted to implement autocomplete in the products. And what do we do? Do we recommend this library that we're, that we're not terribly happy with that we're using, or do we recommend the library that this other team has had to hack in order to work, you know, for their for their thing, or do we recommend this other library that nobody is using? No, none of those are good solutions, right? So I had some bandwidth and I had some time and I, and I built on it. But that's, that's where it came from. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown of existing autocomplete components. Because in general, it's not good to reinvent the wheel, right? Okay. So, actually, yes? I was Googling, you know, I didn't know anything about this. And, and the first, one of the first links on Google comes to a dead link and says, Oh, this is deprecated, and now it's part of UI. Do you agree? UI, is that right? Um, so the, 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 that wasn't was even whatever, whatever, you, whatever you found on Google was not. Okay, this is like is not mine's Google. like a month old. Okay, yeah. basically nobody knows about it except for like, okay, right. So there are lots of things called auto. It, yes, I mean autocomplete is just yeah, made, it's like a design pattern which you use it. So jQuery UI is raise your hand if you're familiar with jQuery UI. That's most people. Are. Their components are hit or miss. Okay. Much love to anybody who works in an open source project, but jQuery UI is hit or miss. Um, you can, it's pretty simple, you can type things and it finds them for you. Right? Um, specifically, the, the functionality that we needed had multiple values. So 
And I'll show you this in just a second. But this lets you do like, multiple values. Right. Um, but I wasn't enthralled with this as the, you know, if this is the, if this is the purported best way of accomplishing this, I'm not, I'm not enthralled with that. I'll talk about that uh, later. This is another option. This is called jQuery token input. This is what the other team at Pros was using, and they can hack it together to get their custom, their custom solution. Um, this is also not bad. It's real similar. Um, this is also real similar to the uh, jQuery UI, but again, it doesn't have this, this key value facet functionality, which this one has. So this is what we were using on my project at Pros. So this is this is actually pretty cool. Right? You've got U.S. state, and then California, count, people, and then you can backtrace through all this. Right? So this is pretty neat. This lets you do anything that's like A, B, A, B, A, B. You can build a, a quick hierarchy right now. <clears throat> so there's a couple problems with this, though. This is slow. It just, it does, it, it's, it's actually, it's not like horrendously slow, but it's so slow that it's noticeable, and it's really noticeable in an older browser, which is one of our, one of our objectives. And you have to do key value, key value, key value. Or I think you can just do key. But you can't do like ABC or ABCDF or just ABC with an arbitrary amount of lists, right? You have to combine those things. So it's good. It's good for their purpose, but not totally flexible for us. And also, it wasn't going to work for the other teams at, at Rose. If this is a little confusing, just wait till I get the examples. I think you'll, you'll understand. Because basically, this is not what we want, right? This is not what we want. Um, at the end of the day, none of these components had exactly what we were looking for, and none of them were easily modified to meet our requirements. The closest one that was easily modified was the token input one, which is the one that the other team at Pros used. But they had about 100 lines of code, and for our, 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 our requirement of like arbitrary nested hierarchies, it was going to be it was going to be ridiculous. Right. So <clears throat> here were the objectives. Right. So. We wanted to be okay. yeah. 100 lines of code, and yours would have taken how much? I mean, I did. like so, like the library, the, 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 the token input library is like 1,200 lines of code, from, like, right by itself. They had added about 100 lines of code to get it to work for their oh, specific okay. use case, which was specific to their use case. So we couldn't go to other teams and pros and recommend it and say, go and use this <coughs> because it's not going to work, right? For your, for your use okay. case. Hundred specific to their project. It wasn't yes. hundred general lines that they could share with the world. Correct. That's that's what I think. Yeah. And and when I show you, I'm gonna show you some demos. Like you'll see the use case I'm talking about. So feature uh, objective. So feature complete for basically for my team and the other team and all the future teams of pros that wanted to use it in a standard config, meaning nobody's gonna have to hack the guts of this library. It's gonna work out of the box the way you need it to work for your project. <coughs> I7 plus compatibility, right? Uh, faster than the alternatives. If it's fast in IE7, it's fast in your modern browser. So just make it fast in IE7, right? right. Seems so simple. Right? Um, minimal dependencies and ease, easy for developers to use. These will increase your adoption rate. And generally, it's just a good thing for a library to do anyway, right? Um, visual search had a lot of a lot <laughs> had a lot of dependencies. We had a lot of problems wrestling dependencies that we didn't need. Know, in the library, and that's not that's not great library design. Right? Yes. In, in general, like you were showing the examples of all the the choices there that were built in. Is that necessary, or is it a JSON blob it's or a database access? Yeah. We'll get to that. All, all, all of the above. All of that. All of the above. Yeah. Right. And we'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what is this thing that I'm that I'm talking about? So, by the numbers, just real quick, it's like 2,500 lines, about 100 lines of CSS. These are the file sizes for reference, right? So it's much smaller than like jQuery. It's, the CSS is tiny. <coughs> Gzip, this is even smaller, right? But I just want to get you the idea. This is a relatively small library. It's not going to kill your page. This is not the heaviest thing in your page. Is what I'm trying to say. Um, JS code is pretty clean, right? It passes the closure linter 100%, which is nice. It works in IE6 plus. A caveat to that: the CSS in IE6 is not fantastic, but it works. You're gonna, you're, like, it'll be functional for your customers in IE6. And it's just it's fast too. Um, minimum jQuery version 1.4.2, which come on, that's you know like you have that. If you don't have that, you've got a you've got a bigger problem. <laughs> uh, 
Um, it's open source with a liberal MIT, MIT license. How long did it take So January is the only dependency? That's correct. jQuery is the only dependency. And it honestly would not be a stretch to remove it. <coughs> and one, like, if I have enough time, I'm going to remove jQuery's dependency. It's going to have no dependencies. So, I, like minimal, I'm, I like things that are minimalist. I'm very minimalist. Uh, I think it took me, um, how long did it take me? A month and a half? I think a month. Something like that. Yeah. Something like that. Or you were using it after what? Four weeks? Yeah. Maybe, maybe even sooner than that. But Phil was my first customer, so he was <coughs> my sounding port. I'm, I'm his preferred customer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go fix your widgets, bro. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's see. If you want to uh, follow along, don't because okay. pay attention the to my. The same has been a lot of pros where people get a month or six weeks to do something that is going to release open source. Um, where you for? I, I don't know. I'm the first time. Well, that's, that's an impressive investment. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a way. That, so it's, it's nice that they finally release it. Sure, sure, but it's really. I mean, what do they what do they lose by that? It's a win. It's a win 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 for them, right? Because they they already had two teams that needed it, with teams other teams that wanted it, right? I built it. Now it's done. As soon as other contributors start adding code to it, that's free work for the pros. How are they well, using other people? And we're hiring. Extending. So, and they're hiring. Yeah, they're hiring. <laughs> I think that was yeah, cool of a company. People are going to extend. They're going to look at your request yet? Oh, yeah. It's very young. Yeah. Yeah. It's very young. Yeah. I'm sure that I have. OK, anyway. Um, Autocompletejs.com is the domain. If this is hard to read, let me know. Can you guys see this in the back? Is it big enough? Kind of. Yeah. OK. Um, I'm going to plow through some examples. And I'm gonna, uh, so, okay. first example, right? This is basically one line of code, right? I mean, this is two lines of code, but you can make this in one line of code. And we're up and running, right? You can delete it, you can click these, your mouse, and use them to select. You can have multiple yeah. right? So that's, that's one line of code that gives you this. And you're off to the races, right? But we are just scratching the surface. So, this is what I'm saying key value. This is what I was talking about. So, that you have nested lists. So, uh, you can just, I'll just demo it. You see the code, right? So, we have like meats, fruits, vegetables, lettuce. Right? I mean, you type this very fast. Imagine if you were um, <clears throat> like taking orders at McDonald's and you type burger, cheese, mustard. Right? Like you have, like, once you've picked burger as the first thing, there's only a sub higher than food now. You can enter things very quickly. You see the highlighting when you type like B, things that vegetable, U, I guess, A. It's right. nice. Minimal lines of code, right? We're basically defining the lists that we want, and then we can actually the lists. And I'm going to talk about a lot about lists today. No, we're going to have to compare company that have to. So like if you type if you type this, no results. No reason. So like we're forcing the user to pick from our lists. This is you have five options now and seven options later, you must pick five or seven. Do yes. you allow you to define tokens? Say again? Do you allow you to define tokens at all? You can. I would I would say that. So nested lists. Okay, so same concept where we have these defined lists and we're just basically wiring the lists together, right? And so we get like coffee, you get Cream, sugar, tea has iced tea, soda, right? You see how this has three levels deep, these are two levels deep, right? Again, arbitrarily as deep as you want in a hierarchy, okay? <coughs> Any questions about this? This is making, uh, making sense. What sort of semantics are you using for the styling between the key and value? So, okay. So, key and value is kind of what I what visual search use, or they have a facet, whatever. What I have is I have a, this concept of a list, and then you, and that's it. You just have lists and then you connect them. So right, so like here we have the config, we have lists, we've got drinks as a list, cream as a list, sugar, tea options, <coughs> soda options, nice. Right. And then we wire them together. So uh, so, so children, so like the, when you select coffee on the drinks list, it's children's cream, so that pulls up to this list. This uh, children's sugar, so it pulls up sugar. So, so that that's great, I love that. Um, the more in the HTML that's rendered, um, how is the 
you know, if you wanted to change the way the children of the Yeah. Yeah. Really, really, yeah. It's a good question, though. It's a good question. Uh, this, is, this, this is the same thing as the last example. But basically, you get arbitrary distances to find. Uh, you can have multiple widgets on a page, like you did in insisting that I include that as a feature. But you can have, like, you can have this, and it doesn't, it doesn't conflict, right? You can, like, delete this token. So, get as many as you want on a page. <coughs> uh, let's talk about Ajax. How about that? How about one line Ajax? Boom. That is doing a server request, getting it back, and finally the list. That's one line of code. Okay. <coughs> so, obviously, Ajax is slightly more complicated than that, right? So, here is Ajax with some local options. So, we have like common Texas cities, and then we're pulling in. Other cities, okay. so Houston, see it's searching, then we pull in a big list of cities. Okay. And as soon as it's unique, then it, the choices go away and it built up the rest. It yeah, it's like, in, in, in this case, there's one, yeah, I'm, I'm not typing, but I can be typing it yeah. the same thing. It's, it's, you really have to it. um, it's easier for friends. Okay. Uh, so that, so you can have, you can have options in the page and options from the server. <coughs> so the, the principle of nesting the lists is not different between local options and Ajax. So here we have local animals, and each one of them pulls in Ajax. Right? Are your brain starting to think about how you can use this in your product? So maybe you have like, I don't know, like you're an e-commerce website, and you've got 12 major sections, and then each section, and then you have a popular section which has got 30, and you load that on the home page, and the rest of it just gets pulled in dynamic. Right? Boom. You got that. Also, like, did you catch that? So if I pick one thing, so if I pick animals and I get out of autocomplete, right? Now I'm like halfway in my list. I go back in, I'm right back where I was. And I, if I could get rid of mammals, I go back to the start. It makes sense. And it's, so it's a one-way thing too. So you can't like, you can't go back one step. You would have to go back the whole step and go one deep. Can you mix the multiple options with the single option? So just select mammal and have subcategories. But then also have one with Yeah. Oh, you're saying if you, like, you want to pick mammal and then you want to stop mammal, but there's also options available to you. Okay. And then you go back to the other. So you can have multiple top levels without subcategories and some of You can, you can, but it's a little like the way the way to do that is to is to put an option on the subcategory, which is like no. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and make that the first option for all. For all, yeah, exactly. So that kind of that makes sense. That might be, that might, you know what, submit that as a GitHub issue and I'll take a look at that. That's um, so there's a bunch of, so like, Ajax, like, there, there's a pre process function. If you don't have control of the server or you don't want to change the structure of the server, you can run this pre process function to delete the data as needed to put it in the format that autocomplete expects. Right? Raise your hand if you've had to deal with, like, Backends that aren't the way you want them to be exactly. Right? Yeah. So, so that's that's convenient. Um, Ajax using post, you can, you know, you can, you don't have to. Um, just have to be get request. You can catch the basically anything that you would, any kind of Ajax option that you would need that would be on jQuery, like an Ajax call, you have access to. They give you full access to the jQuery the jQuery object for extending. So you can send custom headers, you can send timeouts. Anything that you would do normally do with Ajax, you have access to it. It's not, you're not really to um, This is caching, local caching. All you have to do is set cache Ajax to true, and it stores it in local CL. It just stores it in, uh, in local cache. Does it still respect the server directives when you do that? The server, tells it, the server knows when its state is going to expire, so it, in, the, it, in the response header it says. So it does not. Like this does not do that. This like what this does is it stores it in local storage for two weeks. Okay. But if you want to set it for less or more on client side. And okay. if the server is caching it, you can just do normal Ajax and that should do the caching itself, I think. Yeah, yeah. I would it would I guess it would depend on what your use case is. Like if it's critical that if it's critical that they always get exactly the new thing, you probably want to turn the caching off totally, which is the default. 
and you know what I mean. But like, so I'm, like, assuming you're in charge of your server and you have your caching set up correctly, I'm assuming you do. If you even ask that question, yeah. Like, leave it like that. That's good. Okay. So yeah. if you if you leave it off, it's going to respect the browser cache. Yeah. Well, it's gonna, it's going to do exactly what jQuery is asking. Okay. So which is so which is yes. Um, so just these are just options, right? So you ask options. Um, initial config. I'm not going to go through all of these, but. Like you can set the initial value of the thing if you want to start people with the value. You can, yeah. Okay. Um, you can set a maximum. You can so you can limit people to one item or three items or whatever. Right. Um, you can add a little placeholder, and that's not like that. That works in IE6. Like that's not the input type of placeholder equals foo. That's like actually its own placeholder thing. Um, there's a really cool error system that I will show you like in a slide later. But you can. There's a bunch of errors that you can get from autocomplete when you misuse the API, and you can control how you get those errors. So you can just like run into a console if you're just debugging in the console. You can alert them to your face, you know, or you can have some backend process that takes them and sends them to the server in production. You know, like I got an error and I want to log it. I'll talk about that in errors in a minute, but you can you can do the errors. Here's so almost everything that's HTML. Back to your question. Almost anything that's HTML can be overridden with these HTML properties. So here I'm setting like the like little double caret as opposed to single caret. That's a this is a better example. So this is like so we have a bunch of numbers, right? And here's our like our build separator function. So like two is less than one, one is less than four, five is five. So we can dynamically determine what the what the thing is between the two values based on what they are <coughs> dynamically. Make sense? You, you've got control of the way this looks, is, is, is the theme here. Yeah. List config. So, like, the lists are very complicated. Like, you can do a lot of lists. Um, you can set the, like, Ajax error HTML. Um, you can do it, like, most everything that's, that's, um, that's HTML is either string HTML or a function HTML, so that it doesn't always have to be the same thing if you want to. Like for example, in the, in the, in the tokens thing where it was printing greater than, less than, equal than, depending on what the value is, <coughs> um, you have access to that for almost everything that's, that's printed into the DOM. Error. So this is like custom error messages based on what the server said. Like parser error is different than a timeout error. This kind of stuff. Loading string, that's fine. Okay, allow freeform. I forget you asked that question, but if we want, if we like apples, but we also like apple sauce or kiwis, we have freeform here. Right? So, and it tries to match. So, like if you type a p p, we think that you're looking for apple first. But if you really want to enter like a p p, you can do it. So that's that's allow freeform. You can allow freeform can happen anywhere in your lists. So you can get them to where you want them to be. Like breakfast is mandatory if you have to type something that's in breakfast. But then if you go to like lunch, you can type in these things, but you can also order uh, something like salad. Like you can see. So, and then dinner is like completely. Say like 
you know, have, have like, okay, custom, colon, and then what you're typing in, or something like that. You mean as they're typing or after it gets picked? As they're typing, like as in, that, typing. in that metro. Um, right now, there's limited, there's limited flexibility on how that's displayed. It's a very specific case. It is completely fine. It's no, it's okay. <laughs> if, you, if you want, if, if send me, make an, make an issue request, and, I'll, and I can take a look at it. But you, you do have control over the result, right? And you have control over whatever um, okay. thickness you want it. If you want well, yeah, maybe we can talk about it. Okay. Um, so, yes, yes. So in this example, it's only like two level, uh, yes. two levels? Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, this, <coughs> this example is two levels. So this is like key value, key value. Okay. Yeah. So is this a normal <coughs> way to use it, where everything's in that one, one box? You're talking about the code? No, no. Or this? Just the what the user sees. Because you can in, in some ways really it want. looks like a great way to fool the user into thinking, oh, this isn't a very complicated form. Well, these this these is all just one box of sure, sure. typing, and then they they get sucked in and start filling the out use, forms. Sure. <laughs> to agree. Totally. Totally agree. The use case for these examples are for developers to learn how to use the kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't expect that you'll do this on your. See, it's your such website. a simple site to use. It's just one box. Right. Typing. Well, and then you guide them to fill out what equivalent would be like six more. Are you familiar with this? <laughs> <laughs> just one box. The range of choices there is <laughs> Okay, so yeah, this is this is kind of <coughs> so I uh, so I I mentioned the lists right. The lists are the options. And then, so lists contain options. Options are what you pick. And options can be like free form, right? Or they can be something you pick. The list flow, meaning we go from A to B to C, or we go to A to D, or whatever it is that we do, is defined by wiring the lists together. But you can also wire individual options to lists. Raise your hand if that like, makes sense. It's like one guy, two guys in the hand. Okay, so you don't have, I'll, just do, I'll do it, okay? Regular comb, strawberry, whipped cream, nuts, no sugar. All right. Or bowl, chocolate. Uh, hold on. This might be the wrong example. Oh, sorry, this is the wrong example. Uh, this is the wrong example. Um, let me get back to this. Sorry. Sorry. I'll get back to that. But this just shows you that you can have you can you can have an option take you to a new list, or you can go from list to list to list to list. Does that make sense? I'll show you some more examples. Maybe you'll maybe understand. It's the list. The whole idea of lists and options is kind of kind of complicated. Okay, cool. Yes. Let's scroll down. Oh, this one. Oh, previously. Yeah. Previously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's guys say the top part. Oh, sorry. Okay. So I've got like lists, and I've got children, right. and then I've got. Like this list has children, this list has children, this list has children, okay. and then uh, there they are right there on the phone. So the, 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 na the value of children is the name of a list. Right. Um, matching, so let's talk real quick about the algorithm that it's using to match. Um, it's not as simple as you might think. So it's three, it's three matching. It's a front string matching, and then substring and then any character in that order. So A pulls up apple before it pulls up banana and orange. Right? Um, P will pull up just uh, that's another example. So like A in, right? It's gonna pull up banana before orange. Um, the state's example is better, let me find out. But you can override the point is that you can override the function to do exactly what you want. So you don't have to be dependent upon my matching algorithm. Right. If you don't want to offload it to the server, which you can do, like with Ajax, you can just offload all the matching to the server and have all the complexity you want in whatever language you want in the server. Um, if you have the default one, then you can override it with whatever you want. So, like in this case, if you if they want to type in the PLU code, it pulls it up. Right. And this is kind of a silly use case because you want to put that in the option anyway, because people are users are expecting to type what they can see. Right. But this is just to show you that you can override the default. Here's some custom, like you can, your HTML, like modification question, like you can 
you have control over how things are displayed. So here we have a list of states, and then we've got like the name and then abbreviation. So you've got strings so, of like you have a, like a pure string, a string with very simple simple templating, and then you can have it as a function if, as you want. So here, here's a this is an example of the matching algorithm. So like um, OLO brings up Colorado before it brings up California or Florida, right? Because that's a substring match, and then these are like just character matches. Let's another example, like a CA. Say again? MI. MI is going to bring up C. It brings up all the front matches first, and then the substrings. There's one substring, and then the end character. Right. That's, that's basically what these are. <coughs> Something else, too, this matching algorithm is working against the HTML. So if you have whatever crazy HTML you've got in there, it will match against. But it doesn't match against tags and properties and special characters, right? Does that make sense? So you can add <coughs> span class state name, close span, span class state abbreviation, close span, and it will like if you, if you type span, it's not going to find you, right? Like it's matching against just the text and HTML. So like, yes, there is like some naive HTML parsing function inside AutoComplete that does that for you, and that's very tricky to get right. Here is an example. Uh, we have like a list of users, and then we want to have the options be one way. Today here we have span class, and then we want the tokens to be another way. So we yeah. get. See how the admins have an A here. So you can have custom whatever whatever you want it to be. Right? This is just kind of scratching the surface of what you can do. But there's a reason that I give you like full HTML control. Right? There's not you're not limited to just like adding CSS classes. You can do whatever you want. You can do like countries and have little country flags. You can have, you know what I mean, if you have e-commerce and you want to like picture of your product category next to the product, it's easy to do. You just add the image and go with it. Option. Thank you. This, oh, this is that example. Okay, so here's the, here's the, uh, the ice cream example. So we get to here, we get to here, and if we want, Hot Fudge is going to ask us if we want like the other toppings, right? But if we get to here and we say no toppings, it's done. And it kills the list. So your lists don't have to be, they, they, they can die at any point. That's kind of like your question, where you wanted it to like stop at some level. Or like you want to stop at all, essentially, and then go back. You have, the point is you've got control over the list. Over the list. Something I didn't mention is that, something I didn't mention, you see the options here? The options have these values, like the name and username and admin true. You get that out of the widget. So when you select a value and it stores it in the, in the thing, it's not just storing the string or the HTML, it's actually storing the value you have in the option. So you might have username is JB, user ID is 39745, and you just want to show JB in the field, but you need to make an Ajax request with his ID. You can pull that out. Um, and so it, it looks like the, you have some some sort of template rendering um, with these values uh, being a, available. Is that yes? Is that your own role sort of templating, or is it using some engine underneath it? No, I mean it's literally like a four-line function. It okay. Does string so, replace on it. So there's no like else or anything yeah. that lets you. Do you them. need that? Use a function. Okay. Use a function. That's what they're there for. Right. right. But the, like most people just need. Where is that? That's 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 all that most people do, right? Sure. And that does that does the HTML escaping for you. So you can I, I deleted this example, but it, like if you have all kind, of, if your values are crazy HTML characters and stuff, it, it'll work. Just trust me, it'll work. I've tried it. No. <laughs> yeah, what does it, what it, the values look like if it's uh, if it's a bunch of nested options? It's the values that come out of the widget. Also oh, great, great question. Okay, so that is here. So, this kind of gets into docs. But it comes out as whatever you put in here, is, this is an array of arrays. And the value is an, op, is an option. Sorry. The value is an object, which is whatever value you had on the option. So you'll have like, if it's JB within the information on JB, it would be like an array, an array, and then JB's object, and then the next person, the next person, the next person. Okay, but what if I three levels of nesting? So, you, so that's, that's why it's an array of arrays. So you'd have like a, let me, 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 let
you don't get you don't get nesting. You get a regular. Right. Yeah. That's a good question. This is kind of hard to explain. Yeah. Let me just finish the examples. You get events, so you can change the. Uh, so there's an event system. Basically, you can when it changes, so we can like, add these things, and then when we go to remove it, it does a confirm, and if we say yes, it removes it. And if we say no, it doesn't. Right. But the point is, you get the non change function gets the new value, the old value. You can do whatever you want. You can lunge it, change it. Um, let me show you a real fast answer to your question. This is an example that just prints the uh, to the console. It just prints the new value and the old value. So here you go. So like I don't know if you can see this, but the old value was an empty array. The new value has the HTML and the value. It's an array of array. And we, you know, the next one. Does that make sense? So in this case, there's only one entry, but if there's multiple, this array would just have multiple objects. This is a little verbose, but it, it has to be this way because you have to have access to the full, like, the full graph. Yeah. So then you have add option. You can blur the field. You can destroy it.
you what you know, if you want it to change dynamically, that's going to be its own thing. I, mean, I don't know how people are like. I don't know how people are going to use it, but I do know that they will be using JavaScript, else it wouldn't exist. So it's like you have to cross some threshold of um, you know JavaScript where before it becomes usable. Like someone else had had a, had a feature request for me where he wanted to like. A, has anyone ever used Chosen? That library for input fields. It's a couple of people, right? But basically, you can put it on a page, and if you have a if you have a drop down, it converts it to something like this, right? Which is like really convenient. He's like, well, I want to do that. Well, you have to initialize it with JavaScript anyway. So why, why add all that markup to your page if it's going to get deleted and put in memory? Like, I'm not, no, I'm not going to add it. Right? Like, that's a good, I like the uh, flipping. That's a good one. Okay, stop. Yeah. How do you test this? How do you do test you it? Do you have those tests? Uh -huh. I mean, it's very complicated and a lot of yes, semantics. Yes. And I was just wondering, do you worry when it's released and then you fix a bug? Or So uh, chain dot doesn't quite work. I have approximately zero test cases. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I just wonder, have you tested? It? But I do have, I do have all those examples. That I, that those examples are my test cases. Essentially. That doesn't mean that I'm anti-testing or that this will never have some gigantic test suite. But for now, the examples just tell me, you know, when it's, it's working. Um, let's talk about docs. So let's, let's, yes. Oh, yes. I Quick scenario. I'm just wondering if this has ever come up, but um, yeah, is there a way? So I, the way I'm thinking of this is uh, for something like a Lucene search syntax, where you might have you might type in a field name, and so that might be a, a sort of autocomplete dropdown. And then once you do that, um, you're sort of typing your your query parameter for that field. It, have you thought of having like so once that field is active, you're now in like the first nested list, right? And then you're typing the values you want. Um, and so maybe you want to specify six values, and, and they're all attached to that list. But could you specify like a, a keystroke or something to, to, to exit that nested piece to, to sort of complete it, you know? Oh, instead of having like an all option. Right. Kind of. Right. I don't know. Uh, Maybe like a tab or something gets out of it and completes that box. Uh, tab is select currently. But, uh, oh, true. Well, but like nothing was tight or something. If you, so it definitely can be done. I'm, trying, I'm just trying to think of thinking of If you want to do that today, you could do that today. But you would have to override like the, the event system. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So like doable if you like really, really want to go to that path. Sure. But it might be, it might be the path of least resistance to to just give a stop option or whatever. Uh, also think about your user, like what, you know what I mean, like what, what user that's not you is going to be able to use that, like magic keystroke to fix up a list. Well, I'm just wondering, I think you, you could have a, um, so the way I would envision it is maybe there's there's some style, you know, that's grouping that all together and sort of making it clear that, that you're still in this group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you could append an item to the end of the drop-down list that says tab to complete or yeah. something. But yeah. You could, you know what you could do? You could, um, you could do that with the event system. You're basically just listening for what they've picked and change accordingly. Remember, you can, you can change, whenever they change the value, you have a function that can run. So you can, if they pick something, they press tab, you can just pretend like they didn't press anything and kill this. Sure. Okay. But at the end of the day, the, the, the tokens, which is the value in there, uh, that's just an array of array of objects. Right. So you can do as long as your documentation is good, I'm sure we can hack something. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> documentation. Yeah. Excellent. So um, okay. So docs. There's a lot of docs. So I'll cover real quickly. I'm not going to read all the salty, but you have the main config op option, right? And then you've got the list. And I talk about like this is like stuff about the list. And then all the options. And then you have the options, which are what they can pick. And then you have these token, which is the the value in the uh, it's the value in the box. And then you have methods. And then there's errors. So those are like the main those are like the main sections, right? So there is this verbiage you need to know, right? You like know what a list is. You know what an option is. You know what a token is. To use this effectively, there's a lot of documentation about how this works, 
and I want to show you just real quick that some like features, in the, and I'm going to talk about this in my lessons learned, but every single property is linkable. It's linkable, right? So you can link that to your buddy, or you can link to it in an answer on Stack Overflow. And almost all of the all of the options have examples that we to. So like the placeholder issue is this, and there's the example. Right. So now you're back on the examples page looking at that. Placeholder, there it is, highlighted. Right. Um, so it's a lot of, like, you know, it's hopefully you don't get lost. Right? If you see, if you see, if you read this and it doesn't read right or you don't understand it, just email me or open a GitHub issue. I'll try to, I'll try to improve it. But I just wanted to point out the, uh, the URLs, right? Because that's, that's really important for linking to your buddies and linking on Stack Overflow, how to solve problems. And then remember I mentioned the errors thing? So, uh, so, all of, so there's all these ways to misuse the API, like you pass in the wrong number of arguments or you pass a string and it should be an array or whatever. And all of these ways that you can mess up have a unique number, which is just this totally random four-digit number and this text specifically. So you're going to go to Google and you're going to type autocomplete error 6823 invalid value, pass set value, and the first thing that will pull up will be boom. And it will tell you exactly what that error is and what you did to call it. All right, so that's... Try, you know, try to mess up and try to have autocorrect, autocomplete tell you how to fix it. Right. I like this idea. I think that there's some. Um, we need more of this, yeah. right? Memory allocation, the what? Yeah. It's useless, right? I mean, how many, raise your hand if you have searched for an error, error message and found the solution. <laughs> right? It's like everybody. Those are going to appreciate Ruby. It's the. Uh, Undefined method on nil object. That's all right. right. That's right. <laughs> Can you? I, I think you mentioned you were going to talk a little bit about uh, outputting the errors. Uh, the yes. Problem. Yes. Yes. So there's a show errors method. So it can either be false or a string or a function. Um, I, I recommend just setting it to console. If you set it to the string console, it just prints everything in console. Uh, but if you want to have a custom function that you know sends errors to your server or whatever. HTML, but it's using event delegation, so that's good. 
as much pure functions as possible, you know, um, and then um, functions that affect state have guard clauses. So uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with guard clauses from Haskell or Erlang. It's like three people, okay. Um, guard clauses means I'm going to invoke this method that's got arguments A and B, and if A is not exactly, if A does not, uh, if A does not fulfill this condition, then I'm not going to execute the function, or it will return some kind of null or error or something like that, or it will run another function. Like, like I have multiple function definitions that are all that are all called foo, but depending on what the value of A is, it will run a different foo. Right? So JavaScript does not have this baked in a language. Like this, like guard clauses don't exist in JavaScript, but you can simulate them by like exiting or leaving. I've done another thing where so they don't have to Right, right. I mean that's that's the design pattern. It's like I use that a lot. Like I use it as pure functions wherever I can. I'm using a pure function. A lot of my functions have guard clauses. You can call them in any state, and it won't mess up. Yeah. It's really nice. It's really nice. try catch block is not a guard clause. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not. It's not. It's not. No. Real. It's not a guard clause. And yeah. it's used as a guard clause. And I'm I'm firmly in the camp of that's a mistake. Okay. I'm in the camp of that's a mistake. Don't like that. Like try catch. <laughs> I like it really. Exactly. <laughs> This is a breakdown. This is roughly code organization. The numbers here aren't that important. I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of, of how this kind of a project gets broken down into major sections. So, uh, module scope is kind of it's not global scope because everything's contained within a module, but it's, a, it's it is a variable that is like exists that multiple functions can touch. So that's global scope. It's really like module scope. See, I gotta have a lot of them. Stateful, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot of global stateful variables. A lot of them are just like true/false. You know, the constants don't matter. They're like the state. That's what you know. I'm doing that, and it's fast. As, instead of keeping it in the DOM, right? To do the DOM hit, that would be a thing. Um, util functions, data validation. So when you pass in like that, remember the first example where it's just an array. It's like that. Like I'm doing data validation to make sure it's okay, and then <clears throat> I'm doing expansion to convert it to the thing that I want it to be. Um, markup building <coughs> functions. It's not a templating engine. It's just strings. It's just JavaScript functions that return strings. I mean, come on. <laughs> um, DOM manipulation, that's like remove CSS classes as needed. Control flow of data manipulation. This is like the meat, this is like where the hard stuff happens. This is like matching, and like what options do I return, and like my local options versus Ajax options, and all that complexity. It's like 30 functions. This would be the, the hard part of the, uh, of the app. Browser events are like one section, public API methods, and then initialization. Let me show you real fast the I'm not gonna go through this, but I do want to show you I'm actually gonna reduce the text here so you can kind of see. You see like starting scope, right? Everyone's seeing this? Like these are the major sections that I think are broken down. You can you can throw it all together if you want, or you can say, this is, I'm doing this here, I'm doing this here, I'm doing this here, I'm doing this here. So if I had, for example, if I had control flow that, had, that, that affected the DOM, right, I'm, and it's like one line jQuery, I'm going to create a function in my DOM manipulation spec that does that, and then reference it in the control flow. So that I know that when I'm dealing with control flow, like control flow is all verbs. Okay, it's all verbs. Do this, do that, delete this, update this. Um, all the all the all the markup template stuff is very it's very simple it's very simplistic right it's, I'm just saying you know, you're, you want your organization to reflect what it's doing. Uh, okay, that's code. Yeah, lessons learned. Um, learn from your predecessors. So I didn't just look at those other examples and then say, no good. I'm doing my own thing. No, I read their code. I read code. And um, unless you were doing, unless you are, you know, someone else has already done it, okay? Like you're not breaking new ground. Someone's already done it, almost certainly. Or if they haven't done it completely, there's a part of what they did that you can learn from. So don't think you're treading new ground. You're probably not. Uh, stay on the shoulders of giants. It's kind of explanatory. Uh, one of the great things you can learn where other people had problems, right? It's one thing to come up with a new new uh, innovative creative solution to something. It's another to see, oh wow, he had problems here. How can I either mitigate that or is that part of the complexity? Am I going to have to deal with that no matter what I do? Right? Uh, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. Um, 
Okay, so I read the source code of jQuery token input. And so you have that input element in the thing, right? When you're typing. <clears throat> and when you do, so I mean, you have key down and key up, right? Browser events. The key down event is what I want to act on, because that's the fastest event. It's the first time that happens, right? If you do key down event, and then you do element.value, it's not updated. Because that, 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 that key down event happens before the browser gets the letter. Like if you press A, and you get value, it's not going to have an A in it. All right? So it says update the thing. So what are my options there? I can like, I can like, but I can look at the event, and I can see which character was pressed, and I can get the value of the string, and I can append that to the string. Or I can wait for key up, which is too slow. Like there's not, or the problem is, what about the control characters, shift characters, characters that aren't on my keyboard? So if I took the character then and I appended it to the string, I'm rewriting basically the browser logic behind input elements in the browser, right? I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So this is beautiful, a beautiful solution. I'll show you. Do? Yeah. To implement a combo box? 
You're saying this is good code. This is what you should do. Are you crazy? <laughs> Are you crazy? Right? This is. I'm saying this is no good. This is no good. If you see, if you're writing example and you're like, this is how we do this. What you, you should you should stop writing it. You should go back to your API and say our API needs to be improved. Right? So I'm not to hate on hate on them, right? But like this is bad. This is bad. It should be you know viewed as bad. I would okay. say that's one thing I know. You did really good documentation, and I think JavaScript community. I think the, the newer libraries, I think, have been doing a very, really good job with better documentation. But I think there's still some places to help. But one thing you had, I don't know if you have in there, but it really helped me recently is um, we're using high charts, and their high charts examples actually link to JS Biddle. Yeah. And when I saw that, uh, and some other places I saw it more, yeah. more and more, I'm like, man, that is so powerful because you're right. Instead of me having to copy and paste, so like, that is, that is, that's a wonderful it's idea. right there. Yep. I can just start fiddling it. That's one, that's, I, I thought about doing JS Fiddle, and instead I opted for the example in Numenil. This, I got this from YUI2, these two's love YUI2, and they had this, they said, take this example where I had like this, the, like the YUI menu and the YUI stuff and the Yahoo share your friends crap, right? And it's like, and like, and your code is all nested with that on the page. And then it was like, do you want a new page? So it's like, look at this. That's it, boom. I isolate the example, right? It only includes no J, there's, or there's jQuery, there's no CSS. It's absolutely the minimum you need to see the example, how it's working. Right. So that, but yeah, but same concept, right? Same concept as JS Fiddle. Yeah, I agree, I could not agree more that you need to have this. The second part where I like about the JS Fiddle stuff too is we had it inside of theirs. But being able to live edit, I use that to share yeah. with clients because I can immediately just edit the JavaScript, save that for and say, is this what you're talking about? That's true. Just fiddle definitely could. Definitely. I'm more like gonna like I'm like I'm, I was like gonna import all these things to JS fiddle and then like JS fiddle changes the return to service. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I, I I agree that it's that's you a great thing. One thing I actually think JS fiddle is almost a little too complex now because there's so many functions on the left hand side. All yeah. of a sudden you go to it and you miss something and you keep on going back to your example and you do like why isn't mine working at this and that's actually been a problem I've had because yeah. there's so many different. Yeah, I'm just sure. So they're just linking all these libraries that you don't yeah, realize. Yeah, I, mean, I was like, why don't I have this? And yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, I already yelled at you to let you do this. But <laughs> write, write your examples the way you want people to use them. So another example, like I wrote this code, and I wrote this code before I had written any autocomplete code at all. I knew, no matter what, what the backend looked like, that I wanted to be able to do Ajax in one line, and I wanted to be able to do autocomplete one array of strings in one line. Right. So you have you, you have your API and you have your examples. And they're here. And you have the code is here. And they're moving in tandem, right? But this is your leading indicator. Your API, you, you make your API and your examples look the way you want them to look. How do I want to use this? Right? Oh, this is really nice, this is really pretty. Now go make the code work. <laughs> and, and it's not going to be a perfect world where you're going to beautifully write all the examples and all the docs, and then you're going to write the code. No, hell no, it's not going to happen, right? They're going to move in tandem, but, but th this needs to be the leading indicator. Again, like, this, I, I hate loving and proofing, like, they clearly didn't do that, right? They didn't write this and then go write, no, they had this crazy API and they said, well, how do we fit the round peg in the square hole? Well, right? <laughs> That's how they did it. Um, so, examples and API are driving the code, not the other way around. Um, write them the way you can use them. Um, as the linking, that's just good like web design, it's not really specific to JavaScript, but I really like that you can link everything, you know, and like examples have their own page as well as being a page within the thing, like that's nice, right? It's, think about Stack Overflow, think about emailing your buddy, think about IMing your buddy when they say, how does the thing work? Right? <laughs> One link, you know, go read it, right? It's not, Google. It's not buried in five, by Google, right? It's not buried five levels deep in that part of mine. No. And your examples become your de facto test cases. This does not mean that you are now magically absolved of having <laughs> testing. I'm just saying it is. it certainly was useful useful for me to be having all these examples and go back, oh, I broke that. Okay, fix. Oh, I broke this one. I that happened many, many times. So my examples kind of became my yeah. So when you actually talk about your use cases, you mm -hmm. wrote your examples at that time? So, I'm sorry, say that again? When you talk about your use case, like what yeah. requirements you're following, you I wrote, yeah, I wrote, I'll show you, those two I wrote, I also wrote the, uh, 
I also wrote this. I, I wrote this, then I made the code work. Then, then this is where the code kind of pushed back and said it's not going to work. Because I wrote first, I wrote it where the lists were nested, like in a net, like in an object, right? Which is you naturally are inclined to think this is JavaScript. We have nested objects. I'm going to have my list nested. You hit the problems with that in the code because you'll be copying your lists over and over and over and over. So your nests get very, very deep. So I said, okay, that's not going to work. And the code taught me that. The code taught me that wasn't going to work. So then I went back to the drawing board and I said, okay, I know that that's not going to work. How can I do it? And still make it like pretty and usable. Or, or, but knowing that limitation, what do I want this to look like? This, okay, back to the code. Can I make it work? I can. I have to add a bunch of like stuff in the code. Like I'll show you all the validation code. But you have to, you know, I had to tweak the code essentially to get this to work. But th this is so much more important, right? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you do it like a pointer. Yeah. This is your brain. This is your brain. <laughs> okay. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with semantic version. Not enough people. The name of the number. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do yourself a favor. This is like a one-page thing, semver, called semantic versioning. This is the same way of dealing with releases of software. You do not have to be releasing a product to the public to use this. You don't have to be like writing some open source thing or writing this public API to use this. You can use this internally. Like raise your hand if you've dealt with dependencies. Like as for like that's everyone. Like everyone's had some kind of problem with dependency management, right? This is a great way to do this. Is this is created by the guy who uh, helped found GitHub, Tom, Tom Preston Warner. And it's, it's human readable, it's a fantastic idea, like it's so, so good. Um, use it for everything. Even for things that don't matter. Right? Use it for use it for everything. Uh, uh, 0.2. The autocomplete, I released it in February at 0.1.0. And I released it yesterday at 0.2.0. So you can go and download. Big, big blue button on the home page. There's your zip. Okay. Reduce barriers to entry. This this reduced barriers to entry, right? Like like supporting a lower browser and making it fast in that browser may may you know all the other browsers are gonna be fast, right? So that that was reducing. Minimal dependencies speaks for itself. Right? Some for IE6, though, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, it works for IE6, mm -hmm. but my like objective and my requirement oh, is okay. IE6. That's what I thought. It's, it, like it worked in IE6, like as uh, not. It, I didn't. You're, you're not guaranteeing that you go forward enough to keep IE6. But it's, it's really it's really like a litmus test. You know, I'm not like a proponent of IE6, right? Don't don't use it. But don't even build against it. But if, it, if your code works in that, like that's hey, that's, that's not a bad thing. Um, lots of examples, fun of documentation. I can talk about that more. Unique error codes, I think that that's kind of cool. I wish more projects would do that. Um, so what happens, what happens is that it happens to them whether they want to or not. You're a developer and you get an error. And, you, and you're like, oh, you're deep in the code. Oh, this is what the error message is. Something, something method doesn't have this thing, blah. And then you forget about it. And then nine months later, you change some variable with some other scope. And it caused some error and you know, someone, user in Kansas to get that error. And he goes to Google and he searches for that. And now your error string, which you just kind of came up with nine months ago, that you didn't put any thought to, has now become the index of that error. Right? That's exactly how these things happen. But so think about that. Like be proactive and no, give it a code. Give it a code. Give it a home to live at. If you see this, you have done this, this is what you have done wrong, and this is how you do it. Right? Um, here's another, like, here's a simple example. Again, like think about. Reducing, reducing barriers to, to adoption. What, what, if, what library, language, platform, operating system have you not used and why? Right, so 